This is now the invited talk, uh, packaging challenges in 100 to 300 gigahertz wireless, um, given by Mark Rodwell. Rodwell holds a Doluca Family Endowed Chair in Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of California, Santa Barbara and directs the SRC DARPA Com Center Wireless Research Center. His research group develops high frequency transistors, ICs and communication systems. Welcome. Okay, so thank you so much for your invitation. It's a pleasure to be here uh, virtually, even though I'm not here in person. Uh, give me a second to, there we go. And let me turn on my laser pointer. Okay, so I'll be talking about packaging challenges in 100 to 300 gigahertz wireless. Um, I'm at UCSB. I'd like to acknowledge my students who are collaborators. I'd like to acknowledge Monkyo Seo, uh, who was professor in Korea and was visiting on sabbatical. This work is part of a large wireless center called Com Center. So all of these people are responsible for different parts of the work. And I'd like to also acknowledge our sponsors. Um, let me talk briefly about the system just so that you understand why we're doing this. And then we can focus on um, the packaging challenges. So between 100 and 300 gigahertz, excuse me, wireless networks today are seeing exploding demand because of increased uh, use of mobile devices. The industry um, is running out of spectrum, and their response to that, as you know, is 5G, with carrier frequencies broadly between roughly 1 and 100 gigahertz, though today most of that's below roughly 40 gigahertz. This is bringing increased amounts of radio spectrum so that you can um, have more bandwidth to work with, and there's also significant use of beamforming. More on that in a second. So who knows what will happen beyond 5G, but it's possible um, that the next generation might be using yet higher carrier frequencies between 100 and 300 gigahertz to further increase the amount of available spectrum and to do what's called massive spatial multiplexing. And I'll explain that in just a second, but before I do so, we need to make a distinction between the different kinds of radio links. We might have an endpoint link that's delivering signals to the end user, and that'll be tend to be some sort of base station that's talking to a variety of mobile things, people are in cars or drones or whatnot moving around. And then to get the signal back to the internet backbone, we'd either use optical fiber backhaul when we can, or when we can't, we'd use other backhaul links on a radio millimeter wavelength. So let's look at that in more details. Why might we do those things at higher frequencies, AKA shorter wavelengths? And the answer is besides getting more spectrum, the shorter wavelength allows us to do what's called massive spatial multiplexing, meaning massive number of simultaneous independent signal beams. So what does that mean? First, let's look at a base station here. That might be some gadget on the top of a telephone pole. It might have, say, four faces to it, north, south, east, west. Each face might be an array. And if you're going to make an array, the element spacing needs to be about half a wavelength. So if you have a certain size that you can tolerate, the shorter the wavelength, the more elements you can put in. Why is that important? You can make as many simultaneous independent beams as the number of elements in your array. So you double the frequency, the double the number of elements, you double the number of independent beams you use, you double your communication capacity. That's for the end point link. There's also backhaul and similar tricks can be played. You can have an array either in a straight line form or in a rectangular form where you have a set of transmitters. And of course, in propagating, these are all going to mix against each other and get jumbled up as you get to the receiver. But if the receiver is a set of individual receivers, then those collectively can act as a phased array. And if the array is long enough, it can sort out the signals of the individual transmitters without any loss in signal to noise ratio. So when you work that out, the number of channels you can support in a given propagation distance with an array of a given physical length varies as one over the wavelength, which is to say in proportion to the frequency. So again, higher frequency, you can get many channels in and increase your capacity that way. And if it's a square array instead of a linear array, you, you win even more. So the final application is, of course, in things like imaging radar. We might be driving a car in a civilian or a mi mi military scenario. We might want to have an almost TV-like picture 
And so we would like to envision in future imaging radar systems that give us almost TV light resolution. And the key, of course, there is an, an array of a given physical size, the shorter the wavelength, the sharper the angular resolution, the more the pixels you're in your image. All of that is great, but you've got to understand that uh, the atmosphere has high losses at these frequencies if the weather's bad, or even if the weather is good, but it's humid. Even setting that aside, you get path losses varying as the um, proportion to the square of wavelengths. So high frequencies make your signal, um, signals weaker. Furthermore, at any moment in time, the higher the frequency, the more poorly your electronics works, both in terms of transmit, output power, and receiver noise. And finally, your beams are easily blocked. And so the message in these systems is the capacity can be huge, almost pushing a terabit, but the systems are inherently short range, a few hundred meters. Um, in addition, you have to deal with beam blockage by having redundancy in your systems. So let's just drill into that very, very quickly before I get to packaging. Um, here is one example uh, in a little bit more detail. This is the endpoint link where you might have arrays on top of a telephone pole. The array might, ha might have, say, 32 elements. To manufacture that cheaply, that 32 element might be made out of submodules called array tiles, each of which has eight transmitter or receiver channels plus a set of antennas on it. And then again, you take four of those tiles to make a 32 element array. That system might talk to 16 people. It might provide 10 gigabits per second per person, giving you overall 160 gigabits per second. And you're looking at transmission range in the range of 40 to 70 meters, even with huge safety margins for the practicalities of a real outdoor application. The handset for this would have an eight by eight array, which is about a square centimeter in the handset, not too big. If we look at backhaul as a second example, we might be trying to send signals over half a kilometer. Each element of the array might be in turn a little subarray of 16 elements. Why do that? And the answer is to provide a little bit of angular beam stirring electronically so that it doesn't have to be mechanically aimed that precisely. And again, we're looking at eight elements on transmit, eight elements on receive. If each element does 80 gigabits per second, then overall we've got a net capacity of 600 gigabits per second. And for this audience, I won't go through the link budget, except to say in terms of power and noise requirements, that's within today's state of the art. Just looking, since we're a packaging audience, let's, let's consider what that four by four subarray might be. We'll come back to that later. It might have a little tray module with four transceivers on it and four antennas. And then we stack up four such trays to make a overall 16 element array, okay? I'll do this in, late, in less detail, but here's a example of an imaging automotive radar. The overall elements of the array would be about 15 centimeters, in other words, six inches long. You'd have about 36 elements vertically, about 200 horizontally. And when you work that out, you can see over about 200 meters range, enough to give you about five seconds warning at freeway speeds before you crash into it. You can see a soccer ball in heavy fog or rain, even if the soccer ball's only got about minus 10 dB reflectivity. This is probably the first sort of application that will hit the commercial market, I, I believe. Let's look quickly at what the electronics can do before we move on to your interest here, which is the packaging. In terms of the transistor technology for these systems, CMOS is astonishingly good uh, up to about 150 gigahertz, producing even fairly decent, though not huge amounts of output power and good noise. But it dies pretty quickly above that. The technology nodes that are best for millimeter wave and not the most highly scaled ones are in this range. Indium phosphide bipolar produces uh, tremendously good efficiency and pretty good output power over this frequency band. Silicon germanium, not as good as indium phosphide, but beats CMOS above 200 giga gigahertz. Gallium nitride is the winner at lower frequencies, but at least today is um, still working on providing good performance at the higher frequencies. And the indium phosphide based field effect transistors you bring in whenever you want the best receiver noise. So just quickly showing you what you can do. This is by no means a world record I see, but here's a 140 gigahertz transmitter and receiver chip in uh, 22 nanometer CMOS out of my group. There are far better ICs out of Gabriel Rebez's group at San Diego and Ali Niknajad's group out of UC Berkeley. But this is typical of uh, what one can do at these frequencies, okay? I'm just showing you more IC examples out of my group, a set of power amplifiers, that's a critical function in a transceiver. These are all in indium phosphide bipolars. 
140 gigahertz with about 100 milliwatts and 20% efficiency, and moving up in frequency one, uh, basically 200 gigahertz and 270 gigahertz, still producing 50 milliwatts, although at a lower efficiency. And these technologies are improving. Uh, the key is to get um, good efficiency, good output power and low noise out of the ICs. Showing you quickly some IC results. Um, here's a single um, channel transmitter IC at 200 gigahertz. Output power is about 50 milliwatts. Modulation bandwidth is about 20, 25 gigahertz. Here's a receiver IC, similar bandwidth, about 6 or 7 dB noise. So these are not perfect performance, but these are pretty solid ICs that you could build really good communication links, satisfying the link budgets that I just showed you, for example. OK, um, we have in FAB similar ICs in indium phosphide at 280 gigahertz, where again, we're shooting at that backhaul application. Output power is similar, about 50 milliwatts, even at 280 gigahertz. Uh, the receiver noise has gone up, and probably you want to use a field effect transistor, not a bipolar transistor, to improve the noise. So again, what I've done quickly is given you a systems overview and shown you what the transistors and ICs can do today. OK, so now let's start, start focusing on the things that interest this particular audience. First, let's talk about, about array modules at 140 gigahertz. <clears throat> so here's the module design problem. Uh, in the millimeter wave frequencies. And the key point is we really have to first think of the application. Here's a jet plane that maybe has a radar system that needs to steer its beam both horizontally and vertically, and it needs to do so over almost 180 degrees in each plane. To do that, you need a two-dimensional array, and the elements pitch within that two-dimensional array needs to be half a wavelength. Now, that brings a couple of problems. One is if you've got the electronics sitting under the antenna, you don't have a lot of space to fit the area, all of that electronics. And the other is that's generating quite a bit of heat and you don't have all of that much area to get the heat out. So you've got a problem in thermal resistance. The other thing you can do is say, fine, I'm gonna move the array antennas to the side and have a series of interconnects between the array antennas and the electronics. But now you have two problems. What's obvious is the high frequency losses on this wiring. What's less obvious, but less obvious, but even more of a problem is how do you make all of these interconnects between the electronics and the antenna array fit as you go to larger arrays? And I will talk more about this in a few moments. It is critical, however, to understand that not all systems need to steer in two planes. A very, very large number of systems, it's okay for it to steer in only one plane. So for example, in this base station, a crude way of describing this, and I'll be a bit more careful in a moment, is there's no one up here in the sky and there's no one holding in a, hiding in a hole in the ground. So perhaps linear beam steering is enough. And if you've got one dimensional linear beam steering, then we can have a linear array and the array tile margin for a linear array looks like this. And there's lots more space on the two sides of the antennas to fit in all of the electronics you need and there's lots of space underneath it to put in a heat sink and a metal carrier and whatnot to get the heat out. There's a second point is in a backhaul link, we certainly need electronic beam steering to keep the two pointing against each other so that the precision in aiming and the resulting installation cost is not too large. But we don't in this neat case need to steer over a wide angular range, just enough to take care of the initial installation error in the case of steering over a, a few degrees, the array can be two dimensional, but the elements facing can be much less, much larger than half a wavelength. So that becomes a lot easier. Okay, now let's look at that linear array question in a bit more detail. I was a bit glib in saying there's no one floating up in the sky because indeed there might be someone at the top of a tall building. So your worry is someone that might be at the top of a tall building that's nearby, but hang on, if, if we're a near building that's tall, the angle of the beam is large, but the distance is not so small. So if you ask the question, what would it take to keep the signal strength the same as we move along at a constant height, getting closer and closer to the receiver? And that turns out to be simply a one over sine squared theta variation in the power at large angles. And if you look at that and say, well, if I'm going to provide that signal to the people at the top of buildings, not just people down here at the ground, I'm adding this additional power that I'm radiating in the side lobes, which means I'm throwing away power in the main beam. That's a 10 minute math problem. And I'm plotting that as a function of what the vertical beam angle is. But the punchline is you'll never lose more than 3 dB power in the horizontal direction 
if you provide these side lobes so as to provide coverage to tall buildings. So the key point there is you don't always need two-dimensional arrays. Here's another important point is here I'm showing you a phased array. This is the overall array and it's composed of individual elements. Now I can take those elements and I can put it in some sort of a rectangular form here, or I can take the same number of elements and just put them in a straight line. Now, what's the implication of that choice? In the case of this array, the focus beam is a rectangle and I'm steering that beam both horizontally and vertically. In the case of this array, the focus beam is highly astigmatic. It's really tall up to down, really skinny side to side. But the overall field of observation or field of regard of the array is set by that of the individual elements and is not changing in these two choices. So which one should we pick? Well, if we take the two dimensional array and we imagine that the users are distributed both horizontally and vertically, then we're using the field of coverage well and splitting that up into reasonably uniform chunks where there are equal number of people in each resolvable direction. If, however, we've got people, as is more likely, mostly on the ground and only a few higher up, we're throwing away a lot of our ability to separate users into fields of resolvable direction where there's nobody there anyway. So maybe that wasn't a good choice. In this one dimensional array, I'm splitting my field of view into tall, skinny vertical slices, and I'm getting a good usage or a good overlap between my user distribution and how I can resolve that into individual beams, whether or not the users are distributed uniformly in the vertical direction, as well as in the horizontal direction. My message here is not to say the one dimensional arrays are the correct choice, it's to say how you choose the between a one dimensional and a two dimensional array and the number of elements you have in each of the two dimensions depends on the spatial distribution of the users and of the spatial distribution of things that the beam might bounce off and produce an interfering non-line of sight path. I can take that same discussion and bring it back to this four by four subarray I showed you in the MIMO case. Now I won't belabor the points, so I'll do it more quickly. I could have split the array into four by four like this, but I could have also split it into a one by 16 or a 16 by one the overall angular scaring range that I can cover to tolerate misalignment in all cases is the same because the element is the same. All I'm doing is taking the beam and making it either rectangular and steering it both horizontally or vertically or making it an astigmatic beam that I steer either horizontally or that I steer vertically. In all cases, I get the same system performance and the same degree of tolerance against misalignment. The real question is where are our unwanted things like ground reflections and which one of these systems would be better in that case. So my simple message there is think, don't be dogmatic in the choice of array geometry. And this choice of array geometry is tremendously important because it influences the kind of challenges that we face in packaging. So now let's move to a linear array and talk about the um, challenges there. We certainly have some difficulties in doing connections between the IC and the, and the antenna at high frequencies, that gets a bit difficult. Probably a more serious problem is removing heat. Um, when we're working in a high frequency package technology, the, the ceramic materials tend to conduct heat badly. We remove heat instead through thermal vias and their performance is not so great. Even in a linear array, there's just a tremendous amount of wires running around, not only the high frequency signals going to the antennas, but DC and control line and low frequency information, local oscillator uh, uh, reference signals, and it can be hard to fit all of these in. And the final thing, which I really need to bring um, to this community, if you don't already know, is economies of scale. There are some awfully good packaging technologies for high frequencies that are already out there. The trouble is that they are high NRE technologies where the manufacturers will not talk to you unless you were a high volume or at least potentially a high volume customer. And so if you're in a small research organization within industry or if you're in a university or government research lab, it's very, very difficult to get access to these things. And in, in addition, the packaging industry has largely moved offshore. So I have here a polemic saying that we really need something analogous to Moses uh, 
for university and research community access to advanced packaging technologies. Let's look now at the connections between the high frequency electronics and the waveguide uh, and the antenna, excuse me. You can do simple MEMS-like processes to, to your integrated circuits to leave little antenna-like structures on the end of it that then get inserted into an electromagnetic waveguide. And that works superbly well with about a dB of loss at a terahertz. It's an R&D technology, but who knows, that might be cheap one day. If you look at ribbon bonding as opposed to standard ball bonding, this is widely used in the instrument business where the volume production volumes are low. The performance is good up to about 200 gigahertz, but it's a high skill handcrafted kind of technology that's ill suited to high volume production. If your array geometry is consistent with it, and most array geometries are not, but some are, then you can simply take your integrated circuit array and you can put a quartz super straight on top of the integrated circuit with capacitive coupling between the integrated circuit antennas and antennas that are on the quartz. And that again will work, this is from Gabriel Rebez at UC San Diego, and that will work again at very high frequencies and is a cheap technology. Mm -hmm. Flip chip technologies not using C4 but using copper stud work well to well above 200 gigahertz, though you do have to think about the overall um, thermal management, particularly if it's a high power amplifier. Um, via, through substrate vias are an excellent technology and you can use the, those not only for grounding, but for bringing signals from the bottom of a package through the IC to the top. And those are called hot via technologies and those will work up to about 200 gigahertz. Finally, wire bonds tend to die at about 100 gigahertz, um, but are good below that. So let me show you quickly some modules that we're doing at 140 gigahertz. This is a linear array tile module that's for that hub that I described to you. You see eight antennas here. There are eight indium phosphide power amplifiers that mount like so. And there are eight CMOS transmitter chips that like, like, like so. Again, this is Kyocera uh, LTCC technology. Okay, here I'm showing you um, views of this thing. The overall module, including the low frequency connections, is about, um, oh, it's about a foot long. It's pretty big. The ceramic piece that I just showed you is right in the middle. Here is the uh, receiver array, just CMOS ICs and antennas. Here again is that transmitter array with the CMOS transmitter ICs in the indium phosphide um, amplifiers. Now we do have results that are in review here. And so unfortunately, because of duplicate publication issues, I can't show the results for you today, but the trans receiver array is working really well. And we're having a few yield problems with the transmitter, but we have some results in terms of multi-beam beam stirring at these frequencies. If I move to 210 gigahertz and 280 gigahertz, um, let's just talk about this briefly. I mentioned the overall concept like so, where we might have a 16 element subarray, and that might be formed in a tile geometry like so. Um, this is what we would like to do at these frequencies, simply because of the realities of, of, of limited supply to advanced packaging technology at these frequencies. Right now we're building for our experimental demonstrations of the link, single channel modules, giving up that a bit of beam stirring. And in this case, it's simply the sort of packaging technology you'd see in the instrument business with the integrated circuit mounted on a piece of copper that's gold plated, printed circuit board like this, bringing in the DC to roughly 30 gigahertz low frequency connections to the IC and an antenna array on a quartz substrate that is ribbon bonded in the manner that I just described to you between the high frequency port of the integrated circuit and the antenna array. That will give you a beam divergence angle of about 30 degrees. And then we can collimate that with a Teflon lens to give us an overall receiver effective area corresponding to the illuminated area of the lens. Again, I comment this is a single beam technology with no beam steering. We would prefer to do like so, but we're being forced to um, not pursue this presently because of limited access to advanced packaging. So if you know how to help me, I'd be, uh, I'll be all ears and love to hear from you, okay? Here, I'm just showing you the performance of these quartz antennas on, uh, these antennas on quartz at 210 gigahertz. I'll have a few technical points about this in a couple of moments when I talk broadly about the materials requirements. So now let's move to advanced packaging. Um, Paul, I've got till 10 o'clock, is that correct? Okay, I'll just keep going until you tell me otherwise. Uh, yeah. Well, okay. if you 
we we should have a few minutes for questions. And okay, answers. so for nine, so maybe just two minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Let me try to move quickly. Okay, advanced packaging. I'm just showing you the slide again to remind you of the key key points in one dimensional and two dimensional rays. I should point that out that the, what's going on at high frequency uh, systems that the dielectrics have to be made thin to avoid coupling into dielectric slab modes, roughly one twentieth of a wavelength in the dielectric. And that's not only to minimize radiation losses, but to minimize skin effect losses. I'd comment that strip line, if you've got multiple planes, can do a bit better with these things. In terms of a one dimensional array, what we would like to have is a package technology like so, with multiple layers of high thermal conductivity underneath the ICs to provide all the necessary wiring and to get the heat out. And one layer or maybe two layers of a low dielectric constant, low thermal conductivity layer for the high performance interconnects and the antennas. Okay, how might we do this? In terms of putting the layers under the integrated circuit and doing that with um, good thermal performance and yet low cost, this community, not mine, is the expert on this, but I'd comment that a quick web search shows you that polycrystalline aluminum nitride or even better polycrystalline silicon carbide can provide excellent thermal conductivities for the layers that go underneath the integrated circuit. So uh, this is, I'd love to have a discussion with this audience about the potential for making a package of this in this fashion. If we start looking at the two dimensional array problem, we have to understand that the ICs are uh, so dense that we can't leave space between them. We can either have a tiled array like such and if it's a tiled array, the high frequency signal must be radiated upwards out of the array. So we need a super straight, such as I described, to get the signal out at, at high frequencies. Underneath the plane of the ICs, we have many layers of interconnects at low frequencies, reference lines, power, and control. And we must route those with reasonable loss underneath the ICs at the same time as getting the heat out. So I would suggest looking at materials like polycrystalline silicon carbide for the interposer would be an excellent thing to do. We can also look at, at tray geometries like such. And when you analyze the thermal resistance of the fingers in the tray, this is in fact workable if we can keep a reasonable distribution of the thickness between the IC and of the metal carrier below it. So again, I repeat that the two viable technologies for this are the tile geometry with the challenges that I've described to you, need high thermal conductivity layers with reasonable high frequency performance underneath and a super straight for the very high frequency signals above. And we can look at also at uh, trade or slack geometries for the array, but it's likely that the assembly and physical design of this will be much more expensive. Uh, in terms of these two dimensional arrays, I comment that at 200 gigahertz, it appears just feasible to fit all of the electronics within the necessary half wavelength pitch. Okay. So I'm rushing now, but I think I've covered all of the key points in the high frequency two dimensional packages. So let me just comment on the trends here and then I'll wrap up. All of this suggests that the high frequency two dimensional array challenge would be enormously difficult. And yet if we look at the equation that describes the received power as a fraction of the transmitted power, and we look at how that varies with frequency, if we can maintain the same aperture area and transmit and receive, hold that constant as we increase the frequency, that will in fact improve the ratio of received power to transmit power. So that would leave you an array, if you were moving from a 100 gigahertz design to 200 gigahertz design, you're gonna say, fine, let's keep the same aperture area, let's keep the same radiated power. Now we have four times as many elements. So the key point to understand is in an array like this is, Although the, we're getting more elements, the power radiated per element is going down. The power per unit area is staying the same. And so our thermal design problem of the necessary thermal resistivity per unit area in a trade geometry in this case is not getting worse as we go to higher frequencies. In a tray geometry, it's the element lateral and vertical spacing that must shrink with wavelength. And we can maintain this distance constant as we go to higher frequencies. And so in terms of thermal design, the tray geometry is even less challenging. So my message here is, despite the very 
um, extreme density requirements in the ICs, this looks like a challenging, but probably solvable problem. One more comment before I wrap up. I've mentioned the idea of placing the antennas beside the electronics in a two-dimensional array instead of above it. The limits to this are not simply high frequency skin effect loss on the transmission lines that connect them, but simply 50 ohm transmission lines have to be fairly wide. So simply, can you fit all of these conductors in sufficient to get connections between the, all of the electronics and all the antenna elements? And a quick analysis says that in a package with four dielectric plane, you've got enough interconnect density available to you to support an eight by eight array at 140 gigahertz. So there are regimes where you can physically place the antenna array beside the electronics rather than underneath this, still for reasonable size arrays. And this of course provides you tremendous um, relaxations of the thermal challenges in the design and in the cost. So let me wrap up there in my talk. The overall challenges in packaging is we need high frequency antenna to IC connections. We've got real problems in removing heat and in just general interconnect density. We've got a big problem with the supply chain. Established technologies, particularly for 1D array and smaller 2D arrays are things like LCP and organic and perhaps LTCC. You can make pretty good antennas there. Copper stud flip chip technology is really good to several hundred gigahertz. We do have to worry a lot about thermal management in terms of thermal bias. In terms of advanced technology, whether it's one dimensional or two dimensional arrays, the message I'd give for you is we want packaged technologies that provide a combination of sort of 10 gigahertz interconnects underneath the IC with simultaneously very low vertical thermal resistance and a single layer either beside or above the IC with a low dielectric constant for high performance antennas. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Mark. This was really a very, very interesting talk with a lot of details and information. Thank you so much. We really enjoyed